Welcome to the Mysteries of Latin America podcast. My name is Andrew Colon, and I'd like to welcome you to the final episode of our series dedicated to the story of the disappearances of Chris Kremers and Lisanne Fron, two young women from the Netherlands who went to Panama for some sun, fun, and adventure. It was on an ill-fated hiking trip, though, that these two young women disappeared, and it's still a mystery as to what exactly happened to them. We've called the podcast series Secrets in the Jungle, The Disappearance of Chris and Lisanne. And I'd like to thank you for joining us here on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. In this final episode, part three, we'll look at some of the theories that might explain what happened, and we'll let you know about some recent, interesting developments in the case that just might put the whole thing to bed. Now, if you haven't heard parts one and two, you might want to check those out first before continuing so you can get the full story. While there are many scenarios that could have happened to Chris Kremers and Lisanne Fron, we'll look at the two most plausible situations that might have happened. They are, one, that one or both of the girls had an accident or accidents and died alone in the jungle, or two, that they weren't alone out there, and someone found them and was responsible for their disappearance and eventual deaths. Let's look at the accident theory first. While the hike along the Pianista Trail near Boquete in western Panama was rated as a relatively short hike, it was potentially a very dangerous trip into an unknown tropical forest. The trail, while rated on many travel sites as good for beginners, was definitely not for amateurs. Now, I've been walking around in rainforests and low jungles here in the Yucatan Peninsula and other areas, and I'm definitely not an expert, and the areas here are definitely dangerous. So I can only imagine the slippery, muddy, rocky terrain, and the super steep drop-offs and ravines and gorges in western Panama could easily take a life. Now the photos of Chris and Lizanne after they got to the trail's summit showed them in good shape, happy about making it to the lookout point. This would have been about 1 p.m. on April 1, 2014. The attempted first cell call to emergency services, remember the 112 call? That happened at about 4.30 p.m., a good five hours into what should have been a three-and-a-half to four-hour trek. That attempt would show me that something bad clearly happened, and they needed help. But if that's what did happen to Chris and Lizanne, why did it take months to find first a backpack, and then soon after a handful of remains, and no other real clues? With the seeming hundreds of people, including guides experienced with the area, and with international search teams, with dogs scouring the areas who could find remains even underwater, why was nothing else found? It's a wild place out there in the forests of Panama. While I don't know Panama at all, I am familiar with the rainforests in Costa Rica right next door, which are beautiful and also treacherous. And I know that if I got turned around and lost even here in the low jungles in the flat Yucatan, or tripped and fell and was injured or died out here in the jungles, it would be extremely difficult to find me. And the amount of wildlife out there might make it nearly impossible to find any of what was left of me. Panamanian officials weren't alone in thinking that the girls died in accidents. Dutch officials also feel that the girls eventually died accidentally, that they somehow fell, possibly from these super dangerous rope bridges near the trail that had already claimed lives, and died from their injuries or shortly thereafter. Maybe they fell down into one of those deep ravines where one of the girls was hurt first and died and the other one died afterward. Or maybe they both died in the same accident or from infections that might have set in from being injured. The fact that the backpack was found with their bras inside, possibly they took them off after being in the humid forest for a great length of time, along with their sunglasses and phones and a camera, and about $80 in cash, for which a local there would be worth much more than $80 is for most of us, also reinforces the idea of an accident. Despite the many, many inconsistencies with how evidence and information was handled by local authorities, 
possibly under pressure to close the case once remains were found to not affect tourism, believe me, this happens here in Cancun too, the theory that they did perish in the jungle seems a viable one. But why such little evidence? And why was the evidence that they did find end up not being helpful to back up this hypothesis? So, what about the idea that the girls weren't alone in the forest, and that they were abducted and or murdered by someone out there? Is it possible that Chris Kremers and Lisanne Fron ran into someone along the trail, possibly while one or both of them were injured, and that that person or persons took them somewhere else, killed them, and planted remains that were found months later? Someone thought this might have happened, at least in the first couple of months in. On June 20, 2014, two months after the girls went missing, Panamanian authorities, when requesting international assistance, described that their investigation had entered a phase in which it was, in Spanish, una investigación dentro del contexto de la privación de libertad, meaning that someone might have been taken against their will. They thought the girls might have been kidnapped, at least back then. There's a theory that the guide who was supposed to take them out on a private tour the day after they disappeared, who has a property near Alto Romero, close to where remains were found, had offered the girls this tour featuring an overnight stay at his property. This guide, whose name is Feliciano, it would turn out had several bad reports on sites like TripAdvisor and other online forums, specifically from women traveling with him alone on excursions. They said he'd become flirty, early on, and he also made advances toward them, sometimes touching them inappropriately, where the women canceled the tours right then and there and went back to Boquete. But this guide was the guide recommended by the language school the girls arranged to come to Boquete with. So who's to know? This guide was also part of the group that found some of the girls' remains. It could be a coincidence, but neither Panamanian nor Dutch authorities investigating held the guide, at least officially, as a suspect. Maybe he found the remains because he had property near that area that I repeat was in the no-go zone at first by search teams and knew the area well and was genuinely concerned for the girls. But I think we've all heard the idea that sometimes killers like to be close to investigations and even try to be the hero. His stories changed so many times since the beginning of this journey, it's hard to say what's real and what isn't. If you feel like you might have had something to do with either their disappearance or death, you aren't alone. People from all over the world who've learned about the case of Chris and Lisanne have pointed the finger of blame at this guide, to the extent that he and his family have received death threats over the years. But if Panamanian and Dutch authorities ruled him out, maybe they know something we don't. Well, that's the guide. There are also reports that this guide's stepson, who has a history of violence, knew the girls from meeting them in Boquete. Reports say he was, at least back in 2014, very hot-tempered and violent, and a member of a local gang of young men. Locals in the area of the trail and in Boquete and Alto Romero say that there is a gang of young local men that's connected to crimes involving drugs, rapes, and murders in the area over the years. Many of these alleged gang members were questioned by investigators. If they were involved, their DNA might have shown up on some of the girls' possessions, right? But it wasn't. But if they abducted the girls and didn't touch the backpack or anything in it, their DNA wouldn't be on it. And would the kidnappers have allowed the girls to use their phones or their cameras? If they'd taken them away to some sort of town or village, they might have gotten a signal and a call out. Maybe that's why the bag was left behind. Or maybe it was kidnappers who powered their phones on and off and took the photos and made sure they didn't leave their fingerprints or DNA behind. When the investigation began, authorities started looking for a mysterious red car or truck that might have been used to transport the girls from the trail to another location and only return them after they had already died. Several red vehicles were being looked at along with their owners, but nothing was conclusive. A private investigator looking into the case reported that one person who had ties to the pandilla, or gang mentioned before, whose name was Osman and whose parents lived by the Pianista Trail, 
mentioned that he saw the girls on March 31st, the day before the tragic hike, getting into a red pickup truck in the town square at Boquete. Some of the people in the truck were later identified as members of the gang. But just three days after the girls were lost, after having gone out to help find Chris and Lizan, Osman Valenzuela was found dead April 4th, 2014, supposedly drowning after suffering a head injury. When it comes to examining possible foul play, we're left with nothing but what-ifs. When I look at how the case was handled, especially by local authorities, there are huge holes everywhere. Leads that weren't followed. Like why was the guide supposedly hired to take them out on a private tour the next day not considered a suspect? Was his alibi that good? Lines of investigation weren't taken, like looking into some of the younger people in and around Boquete who might be children of influential figures and who were also in these gangs. I don't know, maybe I've seen too many crime shows. One thing we do have to remember is that this was almost 10 years ago in a remote area of Panama, and the justice and legal systems in many parts of Latin America are very different from CSI and law and order. Police can be routinely associated with corruption, coercion, falsifying evidence, and many times you are presumed guilty unless you can prove your innocence. And even though Dutch authorities were involved in the case, it was Panamanian officials that carried the case. And these officials were short on resources, training, and apparently time to get the case closed. But the case of the disappearance and deaths of Chris Kremers and Lisanne Frone isn't the only case of disappearances or crimes to foreign travelers in that area. In 2009, five years before Chris and Lisanne, a British man went missing in the Boquete area one week into a three-week stay. He disappeared in August 2009, age 29, after checking into a local hostel. He left the local hostel he was staying at to hike to a local waterfall a few miles away and was never seen again. He was a hiker with experience, which led his family to believe he was the victim of a crime. Nothing was conclusive in his investigation. Now, in 2017, a German traveler was abducted and she was raped by three members of a local rescue team. The woman got lost in the forests about 140 kilometers, a little less than 90 miles, east of Boquete, and three men who were part of the rescue operation looking for her kept her in a wooden shed where she was attacked repeatedly. What saved her life was that she ended up hurting one of her attackers so badly with a broken bottle that they all left to get him to a hospital and she escaped when they left her there. Also in 2017, an American woman was beaten and strangled to death in Bocas del Toro, Panama, just 56 kilometers or 35 miles from where Chris and Lizanne's remains were found and where Chris and Lizanne spent time before going to Boquete. It turns out that she had also suffered blunt force trauma to the back of her head and had been strangled with her own beach wrap by a man who later confessed to the murder. She had also gone on a short hike that day, alone, leaving most of her personal belongings behind in her hostel room. And she was also a young woman in her early 20s. While it would take a professional investigation to see if any of these events were related, I think it's safe to say that a lot can happen in the rainforests. Everything from accidents to assault to even murder. So what's happened since the original investigation? And where are we today? Panamanian and Dutch officials have made pronouncements on what they think happened to Chris Gremers and Lisanne Fron, and the case was closed and ruled an accident. Since then, several media outlets have sent teams to the area over the years to interview possible witnesses, to recreate the hike, and come back with their own conclusions that include everything from accidental deaths to kidnapping, murder, and conspiracy to cover the whole thing up. There's no single consensus but one team came back with a story that might just be the explanation for a foul play scenario. There's a story that was told recently to investigative journalists Jeremy Kreit and Mariana Atencio, who produced an in-depth podcast series called Lost in Panama in 2022. They went to Boquete and investigated, interviewing people, and in those interviews spoke with a woman named Margarita, who was the mother of Osman Valenzuela, a young man who knew the members of the local pandilla or gang 
in the Boquete area. If you remember from a few minutes ago, Osman was mysteriously found dead a few days after Chris and Lizanne went missing. Almost a year after her son was killed, a member of this gang named Jose Manuel confessed to her that he knew exactly what happened to her son and also what happened to Chris and Lizanne. In her story, she said that Osman told her that the gang of young men went up the trail after Chris and Lizanne in a red truck and met up with them after they reached the summit and tricked the girls into going with them on another trail, a more fun trail. But instead of taking them to this cool trail that had a waterfall, they took them to a nearby house where one of them lived, had a party with music, alcohol, and possibly drunks. One of the men, who was the hiking guide's sociopath of a son, made a pass at Chris. When she rejected him and slapped him, things took a horrible turn. This young man who went by the nickname Tito beat Chris mercilessly, resulting in her death right then and there. And then as there could be no loose ends, Lizanne was next. The men then took care of the bodies. I'll spare you all the gory details. And later faked the cell phone photos and activity, along with the camera photos days later, and planted the backpack, shorts, and remains later on, going through great pains to make everything look like an accident. The photo from the camera that was deleted was done by one of the gang members on a computer, evidently because there was a photo that might tie two of the gang members to their disappearance. Then they eliminated any remaining loose ends, which consisted of the taxi driver who took the young women to the trailhead and may have seen the men and her son Osman, who she said was beaten and thrown off a bridge into a river, drowning there. The young man who was allegedly a member of the gang who told her all this, José Manuel, was later found dead by the side of the road almost a year to the day after Chris and Lizanne disappeared, after a drunken dispute with some of the other gang members in a bar the day of his birthday, where he threatened to tell police the story of what really happened. So far, though, no new action has come as a result of this interview. And as gruesome as this story sounds, I think it sounds very plausible. If you add this and other media attention to the passage of time and the telling and retelling of stories and rumors of the disappearance and deaths of Chris Kremers and Lisanne Fron, things have taken on more of an air of a legend than an investigation with people all over the world weighing in on what happened with everything from amateur to professional investigators to psychics. The families of Chris Kremers and Lisanne Frohn and others have visited the sites with radar, cameras, drones, experts, and have examined the model of phones the girls had, along with the camera and cell signals exhaustively, discussed a photo that was deleted and not in any way recoverable from the camera, and as I've said before, come up with more doubts than certainties. What is certain is that on April 1, 2014, two young women from the Netherlands went on a seemingly simple and innocent hike on their adventure to the tropical forests of Panama. What's also certain is that at some point after reaching the lookout point of the trail, things went horribly wrong. In the aftermath, the local government's response was less than stellar by our standards today and Dutch investigators couldn't get much further and were hindered by jurisdictional disputes. Leads weren't pursued. People of interest might have been overlooked. Evidence handling was botched, and the case was closed without proof of accidental deaths. The mysterious additional deaths of people who were close to the case also raises eyebrows, at least mine, that someone out there does know the truth and won't or can't say what really happened. The indigenous communities out there also haven't been forthcoming with information that might close this case. But the history between authorities and indigenous people in the area doesn't help, as justice can work differently down here. And I don't just mean Panama. The final certainty is that we have at least two families who will never see their daughters again, and barring some sort of miracle, may never get clear answers and some kind of closure as to what really happened to them. If there's anything to be learned from this story for me, it's this. 
We can all go back in time and say maybe they should have been more careful about hiking out there alone. And maybe they should have had a compass and emergency gear. Should have worn better clothes for being out in the rainforest. Should have gone with a guide. And maybe should have vetted the language school that brought them there in the first place. They didn't have experience hiking in tropical Latin American rainforests that can be treacherous, along with people who might be even more treacherous. I will more than likely over-prepare the next time I'm 30 minutes outside of Cancun and in the low jungles of the Yucatan Peninsula. While most of you associate this area with beaches and partying, and while there definitely is all of that, the jungles here are a whole different world. Beautiful, but dangerous. But what I also get, and what I'm going to carry with me from this story, is this. If you go to the cover image of this podcast and look at photos from Scarlet R's website and blog or YouTube channel, they were enjoying their lives and treating life as an adventure. I hope I remember to do the same and treat my life as an adventure, maybe as a way to honor their memory. To the families of Chris and Lizanne, if any of you are listening, please know that people from all over the world are saddened and sorry for your loss. And we can only hope that time will help to heal some of the hurt you've had to go through and you can finally get some answers. Friends, I want to thank you for listening to this series I've dedicated to the mystery of the disappearances and deaths of Chris Kremers and Lizanne Fron a little over nine years ago in the tropical rainforests of Panama. If you haven't listened to parts one and two, I strongly recommend you listen to them so you get a better picture behind the events. I also must thank Scarlett R. from the Netherlands for her research, videos, and perspectives. You're a champion, Scarlett. And while you didn't want to be interviewed for this podcast for very honorable reasons, it wouldn't have happened without your tremendous work. I invite everyone listening to check out Scarlet R's blog and YouTube channel, the links will be on social media posts for this podcast, to learn more than you ever thought you could about this mystery. Please make sure to follow and share this podcast with anyone you think you might benefit from it. Contact us with comments or questions, and make sure to join us for our next episode coming soon on the Mysteries of Latin America podcast. I'm working on it right now, and while it's still a mystery, this one will put a smile on your heart. I'm Andrew Colon. Adios. 